Children died exactly five days apart from each other and they died in order of age, from youngest to oldest. You tell me if this is a curse or not. Murcia, Spain in Christmas 1965, Piedad, age 12, was the third of ten siblings, eleven if we count a boy who died in 1961 at just two months old, and the oldest of the girls. Her two older brothers, Jose, 16, and Manuel, 14, dropped out of school and worked in an auto shop to help with the expenses. Piedad's family was extremely poor. Murcia was one of the poorest regions at the time, and they lived in a flat in a council housing building. Antonia Perez Diaz, 36, Piedad's mother used to take some odd jobs as a cook around the neighborhood to help with the income, and her father, Andres Martinez de la Guila, 37 years old, was a bricklayer. Being the older sister of nine siblings meant hell for the little girl. Her mother was seven months pregnant with the family's 11th sibling. Since both her parents and her two oldest brothers spent the whole day away from home for work, Piedad was tasked with looking after her younger siblings, Jesus, 10, Cristina, 8, Manuela, 6, Andres, 5, Fuensanta, 4, Mariano, 2, and Maria, 9 months old. Piedad did most of the household chores like cooking and cleaning while also babysitting the four youngest, feeding, bathing, and dressing them. On top of that, her older brothers required her to help with the cleaning and polishing of motorbikes' metal parts they brought from the car repair shop. Her mother was always tired after having each baby and spent her time between resting and working when she could. When Piedad entered her mom's room, Antonia was holding her youngest and praying. Piedad asked, What are you praying for, Mama? Antonia replied, I pray for more blessings. Tell me, Mama, who is Marco when it comes to God? Marco was her father's competition, and on many occasions he cost her father a job, which meant extra pressure on them all. That would be the devil, her mom replied. Okay, look, mama, I am tired of serving you all. If you don't stop praying for more blessings, I will pray for the devil to help me. On the morning of December 4th, 1965, the youngest sibling in the family, nine-month-old Maria, suddenly got a red rash that quickly turned purple. She also had a high fever and started having strong seizures all within just 30 minutes. They called a doctor right away. The doctor hurried to their house and found the baby girl not responding at all. Sadly, he could only confirm that she had passed away. He said meningitis was the cause of her death. Five days later, on December 9, 1965, two-year-old Mariano suddenly fell ill and experienced the same symptoms as Maria. The family called the same doctor to their apartment. Once again, he could only confirm the death, and once again it was said to be caused by meningitis. Rumors of a strange curse or illness began to circulate in the neighborhood, and people started avoiding the Martinez-Perez family. After another five days on December 14, 1965, Fuensanta, the four-year-old girl, passed away under circumstances similar to her recently deceased younger siblings. This time, the doctor didn't sign her death certificate right away as he wanted to examine her body more thoroughly. He also wanted to take another look at the bodies of Maria and Mariano, having doubts about his meningitis diagnosis. Rumors in the neighborhood escalated, and everyone started avoiding the family, fearing they might get sick with whatever had claimed the lives of the three children in just a week and a half. All the remaining members of the Martinez-Perez family were taken to Mercia Provincial Hospital, which is now known as Queen Sophia Hospital, on the orders of the local health care council. There was a fear that they might be dealing with an outbreak of an unknown, highly contagious and deadly virus. The family was placed in a ward for close monitoring while the bodies of the three deceased children underwent thorough autopsies. The local newspaper, La Verdad, started reporting on the story of a mysterious illness that had claimed the lives of three children from the same household in less than two weeks. After undergoing numerous tests and several days of observation in the hospital, the doctors couldn't find anything wrong with any of the family members. Shortly before Christmas Eve, they were discharged and sent home, 
As a precaution, the doctors prescribed multivitamin supplements not only to the Martinez Perez children, but also to all the children in the neighborhood to ensure their immune systems were in good shape in case an infectious agent was causing the deaths. Pathologists were unable to find any evidence of a known viral or bacterial infection. Instead, they began to suspect exposure to an unknown hazardous substance. Two peculiar details stood out. The children died exactly five days apart from each other and they died in order of age, from youngest to oldest. On January 4th, 1966, after a sorrowful Christmas and New Year, five-year-old Andres fell violently ill and passed away. According to the rest of the family, he had been perfectly fine just half an hour earlier when he suddenly started showing the same symptoms that his younger siblings had experienced before their deaths. Pathologists acted fast. Tissue samples from Andres and Fuensanta were tested, where once again, any infectious agent was ruled out. Then these same samples were tested against toxins where the first breakthrough in the case occurred. Traces of potassium cyanide were discovered. Pathologists in Murcia, who were now re-examining Maria and Mariano's remains as well, suspected the presence of another substance in the children's remains but couldn't identify it. They then fed samples of the children's organs to a total of 21 guinea pigs, along with a dog. All the animals died suddenly. The police were immediately notified. The children in the Martinez Perez family were being poisoned. On January 14, 1966, Andres Martinez and Antonia Perez, the parents, were arrested as suspects of multiple child murders. Due to Antonia's pregnancy condition, she was placed in custody at the maternity ward of a hospital. Andres was taken to a mental institution for a psychiatric evaluation. The remaining children were divided between both parents. The boys stayed with their father at the mental institution, while the girls stayed with their mother at the maternity ward. However, the children were allowed to visit their other parents. This decision, controversial at the time due to the risk to the children's lives, was apparently made in hopes that the perpetrator would make a mistake. Police detectives observed a significant difference in Piedad's demeanor compared to her siblings' more natural behavior. They also noted a crucial detail in the family's statements. Piedad was the last family member to interact with the four deceased children before their symptoms appeared. Additionally, P. Dad was responsible for feeding the young children while her parents and older brothers were at work. At 12 years old, she became the primary suspect. However, aside from these circumstantial pieces of evidence, the detectives lacked solid proof linking P. Dad to the poisonings. One of the detectives had an idea. On January 24, 1966, he took Pidad to a cafe pretending he had some questions for her and bought her a glass of milk. He acted friendly and joked around with her during their seemingly casual chat. Then he held a tube Pidad's brothers gave her for cleaning metal parts. The detective made it look like he was trying to put it in her milk, making sure Pidad noticed. It was at this moment when the 12-year-old girl reached out and grabbed his wrist, clearly alarmed. Although Pidad tried to act calm, she gradually got angrier at him with each attempt. Their interaction from this point on went like this. Don't do that, you could really hurt someone with that stuff. The detective, insisting she drink the spiked milk. Is it dangerous? Is it similar to what you gave your younger siblings? At this point, according to the detective, it was clear from her expression, but he just looked into her eyes silently until she spoke again. I'm the one who killed all four of them. The first three were at my mother's orders. Detective and the fourth. I killed him all by myself acting alone. Piedad explained calmly that she would form small balls with the tube her brothers gave her and mix them with the insecticides. She would then apply this deadly mixture to the children's food and milk and feed it to them. The amounts of each poison found on their bodies would have been more than enough to kill them. Doctors later explained that with these substances and concentrations, the deaths of the four children were incredibly painful. With death occurring in about 30 minutes, Piedad recounted that Fuensanta was the only one of the four who managed to speak as she suffered. The four-year-old girl called out to Piedad for help, saying, Sister, come here, I'm dying. But Piedad ignored her plea. 
Piedad's parents were detained and all her surviving siblings were removed from their custody and placed under the care of Child Protection Services. Piedad was brought to juvenile criminal court, where a judge ordered her indefinite commitment to a psychiatric ward for evaluation before trial. Initially, Antonia, the children's mother, was questioned and suspected of the murders as well. But these suspicions were eventually dropped after Piedad provided up to five different accounts of what happened, only involving her mother in two of them. It became clear that Piedad was lying. Andres, her father, was released in March. Antonia, who had given birth to her baby while in custody, was released in May. Throughout the ordeal, Piedad never displayed any signs of remorse or sadness for her deceased siblings. In fact, it was noted at the psychiatric ward that she often smiled and laughed with the staff. Psychological assessments at the time observed that despite her minimal schooling and functional illiteracy, Piedad seemed to possess a cunning intelligence that allowed her to act with premeditation despite her young age. She was found to be mentally sound and capable of distinguishing right from wrong, but chose to ignore her moral compass to act with malicious intent. In the summer of 1966, Piedad Martinez was formally diagnosed as a psychopath. One of the five different versions she provided involved Piedad killing her siblings so she could have more time to go out and play with her friends, claiming she was simply tired of having to care for her younger siblings. It's believed that Piedad was being truthful here. It's a cruel irony in this case that Piedad is a female name that has become increasingly obsolete in Spain in recent decades, as it translates to mercy in English. But what happened next was the most unbelievable thing. She said her plea to the devil was the cause of what happened. All she did was listen to a voice telling her what to do and when. That's what happened to the family afterwards. In 1966, just a few months after Piedad's confession, her older brothers Jose Antonio and Manuel were offered management positions by a businessman in Albacete. However, their dreams were crushed when they were arrested. The businessman was a con man who stole their modest savings and falsely accused them of stealing a motorbike. After their return to Murcia, they join a gang of car thieves. Jose, known on the streets as El Aguila, the Eagle, would later be imprisoned for murder in 1978 after fatally stabbing a taxi driver during a robbery. Just three months into his sentence, he participated in a jailbreak with 14 other inmates using a tunnel they had dug. Two more of Piedad's brothers would also find themselves in prison at some point in the 1970s, one for robbery and the other for rape. The Martinez-Perez family became outcasts in the neighborhood. Andres, Piedad's father, lost his job as a bricklayer and took on work as a garbage collector for a period. However, he was diagnosed with a degenerative eye condition and eventually lost his sight. He and his wife Antonia struggled with poverty until their deaths. Piedad wasn't held criminally responsible because of her young age. The juvenile court ordered her to be involuntarily committed to a Catholic convent called Las Soblatas. It was a place where troubled girls with criminal records like hers stayed until they turned legal adults, which was 21 years old back then. Piedad appeared content there. She made friends with the other girls and got along well with the nuns. She took up knitting, which became her main hobby, and frequently mentioned her plans to live with her Aunt Loli, who lived alone and didn't have any children, once she was released. There's no information available about what happened to Piedad Martinez, or where she ended up after her time at the convent. Over the years, there have been rumors suggesting she might have become a nun there, but these rumors have no solid basis. It's believed that she might have taken on a new identity after being released. If she's still alive, as of 2024, Piedad would be 71 years old. <laughs>